All right, so we are on lesson 15 today, which is investigating what happens when we repeatedly apply a percent increase to a quantity. Um, so if you can use graphs to illustrate and compare different percent increases, you'll have met the goal. And if you can write an expression to represent the result of applying a percent increase repeatedly. I am recording right now, it'll be linked in the slides. I did teach the same goals last year, just in a different way, if you wanna check that out. Um, so knock yourself out, it's in there. And I'm sure there's plenty of other examples online too. The puzzle piece will be lesson 15. And the next time we quiz will be this Friday over 14 through 18. And then we will be testing for unit five next week. So if you've been slacking on all your practices, you have up until the unit test to get them done. After that, they won't be worth any credit and they shouldn't be because it's honestly a waste of time after that anyway. How much are your tests worth? In this class, it's 80%. So yeah, doing a bunch of homework after that like won't matter anymore. The reason you do the practice is so that you're ready for the unit five test. So that's why you have up until then to get it done because it's meaningless after that. Um, so make sure that gets done. Also make sure that you have your binder check in order. So you should have notes for every single lesson whether it's on your own paper, that's fine. Whether it's on the papers that you pick up every day, it's fine. But you should have one for every single lesson. If not, then you're missing out on basically free assessment points because these go in that 80% category. Because I firmly believe that if you are not taking notes, which is like the bare minimum requirement, like you don't have to be smart to take notes. But I firmly believe that if you are not taking notes, then you don't care about your grade and you're probably gonna do that on the test anyway. Very few kids are like so smart that they don't have to take notes. So, and I get it, like I was like that in high school, like I didn't really have to study ever, but it's not that way in college, like you have to study. And if you don't know how to study, then you're gonna crash and burn. So taking notes is like the first step in being able to effectively study. So questions on that? All right, so now going over the warm up. Um, don't necessarily tell me the final answer, just answer the question I'm asking. All books at a bookstore are 25% off. Priya bought a book originally priced at $32. The cashier applied the store-wide discount and then took another 25% off for a, coupon, for a coupon that she brought. If there was no sales tax, how much did she pay for the book? So don't tell me what she paid for the book. Um, just tell me what would be like the first step in solving this. Nothing? Bannon? That is the store discount, the coupon discount. So you think it's 50% off total that she's getting? Yeah. It is not. Very common mistake. Jalen? So you have to take 25% off the 32 first. Um, do I just do 32 times 25 or what do I do? Good, you have to make this an equivalent decimal. So the equivalent decimal to 25% class is... Good, times that by my original price. That gives me the discount she gets from like the store sale. So what's 0.25 times 32? $8. That's not what she's paying, that is the discount. How do I figure out what she is paying? Subtract it from the original price. 32 minus eight class is 24. So this is my sale price. However, she has a coupon. So the coupon is worth how much off? So I'm gonna again take 25%, the equivalent decimal, which is 0.25. And what am I going to times it by now? 24. 
What is 25% of 24? $6, so that's an additional discount. And then to find what she actually paid, so I guess I'll put the coupon discount if we're labeling stuff. Then I put what the sale price is of the book minus her coupon value, which gives me a grand total of what for what she paid. $18 is what she paid. So is that half of 32? No, so that's why just combining the discounts doesn't work. So if you get like an additional 10% off, you have to figure out, what, or whatever it is, additional coupon off. Um, you have to figure out what the new sale price is and then get 10% off of that or whatever percentage it is. Um, but that's how you, that's what she paid. Questions? So that to me is like how I would normally find the answer. The book also wants to draw attention to this, um, back to exponential function. So for exponential functions, you need the initial amount. What's the initial amount of the book? $32. $32. And... B normally stands for what? Common ratio. Now that doesn't really help me when it's telling me it's decreasing by a percentage. So when it's doing stuff like that, like decreasing or increasing by a percentage, you're gonna wanna switch out that B for like that one plus or minus R. Cause R would be like what you're growing or decaying by, which is 25%. So R would have to be as a decimal, and does the coupon and sale add to the price or decrease from the price? So I would use the minus, and it's 25%, but it's happening twice. So the book has it as this. Granted, the way we solved is not bad. I feel like that's a normal way of solving, but they just want to show you that this also gets you the same thing. So here's the first 25% off and then the additional 25% off, which honestly gives you the same answer once you do it. Um, could also write it like this. Squared, because it's there twice, it happened twice. Um, you could even subtract the one minus the 0.25 already which is 0.75, but either way, you would also get 18 as well. So there you go. Attaching it back to the exponential function. So questions on the warm up. All right, so scrolling down, here's some other real life problems. So to get a new computer, a recent college graduate obtains a loan of $450. She agrees to pay 18% annual interest, which will apply to any money she owes. She makes no payments during the first year. 18% interest is a really high interest rate, by the way. Um, do not recommend it. So when you get a credit card, your interest is probably around that much. Unless you can pay it off within the month, I recommend not doing that. But um, anyway, let's figure out how much she'll owe at the end of one year. So we'll do number one together because you'll do number two on your own. So think back to your exponential functions. What's like the standard equation I told you it is for exponentials? Good. Now, when you, well, let me backtrack. A stands for what? Good. What is my initial amount in this problem? So that should be part of my process. Identifying my initial amount, which is 450. The B we said stands for? Good. Does it tell me anywhere in the problem that it like doubles, triples, goes down by a third or anything like that? So then I probably shouldn't use like the B. I should switch it out for 
Good. Um, putting plus or minus because depending on the situation, it'll be either you're adding or subtracting. So what will it be in this one? Does interest add to the cost or decrease the cost? Uh, Anyone else want to chime in? Any more than just Brian and answer. So in fact, Brian answers slower. Um, does interest add to the cost or decrease from it? It adds to the cost. So it'll be the one plus whatever the rate is as a decimal. What's the rate currently? Eighteen percent. What is the equivalent decimal of that? Point eighteen. If you don't know, just divide it by a hundred percent, and it'll tell you. So I have one plus point eighteen to the t power is what it normally is, or to the x. And it says annual interest. So what does annual mean? Yeah. So once a year, just like how biannual would mean what? What would biannual mean? Twice a year, so every six months. But when it's annual, it's just happening once a year. So if I want to show how much she'll owe at the end of one year, what's going to change about my equation? The T, because T is for what? Class. Time. So if it's just one year's time that is passing, plug that in for the T. And I added the one in the 0.18, so that's why I changed the parentheses. And it's now going to be to the first power. So now that I have values for all of this, I can just plug that into my calculator and actually see what she owes after one year. All right, so 450 parentheses, 1.18 to the first power. So at the end of one year, her laptop that cost four fifty dollars originally, she would have to pay $531 for now because she took out a loan at that high of an interest rate. So questions on that? All right, um, you guys will answer number two now that says, assuming she makes no payments to the lender, how much will she owe at the end of two years? and then three years. So now that I've shown you one, you try it. Table. What does this person owe at the end of two years? All right, check what I wrote. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, actually, I don't know if that's right or not, so we'll put on the end. Okay, well, three, what is it at the end of three years? All right, so we'll see if they're right in a second. Um, table four, what is the process? Like, what is the only thing that is changing from when we did number one? The initial value um, shouldn't change. Like what's in the parentheses is changing? So something else then is changing. The exponent. So initial value stays the same. The 18% is not changing because that's an annual interest. So that is another 18% each year. But the T would change. So like for two years, table five, the T would be what? No, um, like two, like, oh. just tell me what the T would be for two years. Two. two. And then you plug that in and solve. Um, 
for three years, what would the T be table six? Just what would the TV, you want to tell me like, we already know what the answer could be. But what would the TV at three years? Three. So that's the only thing changing. The rest of the equation stays the same. So now let's see, it sounds right, at least from what I did earlier, but I don't know them by heart. So let's see what it looks like in the calculator. So if we change the exponent to two, that is what we get after two years. So good job, that is correct. If we change the exponent to three, that is what we get at the end of three years and they even rounded correctly. So if we're talking about money, how many decimal spots should you round to? Two spots, wherever you need to round to. And for some reason, it's not letting me write um, over here only on the smart board, but wherever you need to round to, honestly, underline it. So if it's two spots, underline there and look to the right of that spot you're rounding to. If that number is zero through four, what do I do with the number I underline? You have it stay the same. If it's five through nine, what do I do with the number I underline? You round up. I did have someone tell me today that they thought it was like if you looked to the right and that number was bigger or smaller than the number you underlined, but that told you you're wrong. All right, no, it's always if it's zero through four, you stay, and five through nine, you round up. So questions on that? All right, um, to find the amount owed at the end of the third year, or sorry, let me read this real quick. A student started writing this. Does her final expression correctly reflect the amount owed at the end of the third year? So is this what I'm about to highlight the same as what we did for year three? Oh, no. Raise your hand if you think yes. Raise your hand if you think no. So, I would say that what she highlighted is correct because what do exponents tell you to do? Multiply the base by itself that many times. So if I expand that 1.18 to the third power, I would have it there three times. And I would still get the same answer if you want to double check that. All right, questions on what we've done so far? All right, um, moving on to the back side. So we're going to change the situation slightly, and this is going to be more of a you try. So three people have each taken loans of $1,000, but they each pay different annual interest rates. Here are those interest rates. For each loan, you guys in your groups are going to write an expression using only multiplication. So in other words, make it an exponential function um, for the amount owed at the end of each year if no payments are made. So do that within your groups. I don't think it takes very long, but I'll give you three minutes anyway, because it's three different problems. Make sure you all agree. All right, table eight. What did you get for your equation for when the rate is 12%? One point twelve. Anything else? To the T power. Class, agree, disagree. Does it look good? Does it have only multiplication? Yeah. Yeah. So it looks good. I mean, aside from the exponent, but yeah, exponent just means however many years. So another way that I've seen this written, and they will use either one on test interchangeably, is with a plus 0.12. That's how they got it. But it did say in the problem that it wants only multiplication. So that's why 
we added it in the parentheses. But yes, they do mean the same thing. So questions on 12%, that would make sense. Where did the 1,000 come from? Class. Uh, Initial amount. They each took a loan of $1,000. So all your A's should be the same. Table one, what did we get when the rate is 24%? No? So the C power, good. Um, table two, what about when the rate is 30.6%? What was that? So just 0 0.306. That one does look a little weird, but still do the same process divided by 100%, and you get the equivalent decimal, which is 0 0.306. And then, of course, add it to the one. Anything else we're missing in this one? No. To the T power. Oh. That way, for however many years they choose not to make payments, you just plug that in and get the total that they owe. Um, it says now to do the graphs. We'll kind of skip that part for right now. Um, let's look at the back side. Or not the back side, but the next part. Now, and we'll do this tomorrow too, because my first hour didn't get this far. But using those same functions we just wrote, we're going to find the average rate of change, which is still like a really big struggle according to the test scores. When you see the phrase average rate of change, what should you automatically be thinking? Not one person? Not even anyone that was in stride this morning? So write this down, because you all, none of you said it. Average rate of change is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And because we're we're basically out of time, um, we'll finish there. Don't lose your notes because we're starting here tomorrow with average rate of change. Mm -hmm. So don't lose your notes. We're going over them tomorrow again.